In this video, I will be talking about the iMac slot load, specifically the low end machine of the first slot load generation. The release that had the iMac DV, but this one was the non DV version, uh, codename was Kihei. Uh, okay, look, it was released October 5th, 1999, discontinued July 4th, 2000. It had a PowerPC 750 processor named the G3 processor by Apple, running at 350 MHz. It had 64 MB of RAM installed. It's obviously not easy to communicate what iMac model I'm talking about. So first, how did the model naming get so confusing? If you've watched this video series before, you probably know that by 1996, Michael Spindler's Apple had made a mess of the product line. Gil Emilio did bring order, innovative design, and build quality back to the Mac line, which could be roughly categorized as portables, consumer and education, and prosumer and professional. It wasn't bad, but when Steve Jobs took over, he took aim at both the naming and the sheer number of Mac categories. When we got to the company a year ago, there were a lot of products. These were the product platforms, 15 product platforms. And I started to ask people, well now, why would I recommend a 3400 over a 4400? How are we going to explain this to others when we don't even know which products to recommend to our friends? Steve reduced it to four model lines, PowerBook, All-in-One, Desktop, and Tower. The ugly but very capable G3 All-in-One was being sold through education channels only. So not available to us regular folks. Yeah, schools wouldn't care what it looked like. So, what about a consumer level Mac? Some of these products were very good products, but as of now, we're making none of them anymore. Meaning there was a gap of over three months where there was technically no consumer product. The iMac was pre-announced by three months for this reason. This is iMac. Once released, the iMac would also become the Education Mac. It was the end of the PowerMac naming conventions with model number slash processor speed. Now simply the computer name, while details like processor speed were hidden on a sticker in the back. As Intel gained ground in processor cycles, it was less and less something Apple would want to advertise. It's got a Pentium 2 running at 450 megahertz. Lots of megahertz. <clears throat> But doing that just made things less clear as to what model it was. But that's still pretty simple, right? Unfortunately, despite Steve's initial good intentions, Apple let model creep go out of control again. Look at all these G4 graphite towers. And I'm not even including the models they said they were going to make, but didn't. So they just went around in a big circle and ended up right back into the Spindler era in this regard. At least they were not junk, like the Performa 6200 and 6300 series. But as I said, this time around you can't tell at a glance what it is. And having no official naming conventions, they instead end up with several aliases. With iMac, Apple's industrial design group took the colorful translucent plastics which they had been toying with for a couple years and thrust them into the forefront. This was the overarching design theme through the life of the iMac G3 series. A machine so curvy they would say you can't find a straight line on the case. Also made it somewhat less stable on the desk than your normal beige Mac. Ooh. In the iMac line, without unique model names, model numbers, or Roman numerals allowed anymore, they were primarily referred to by revision. The first iMac was revision A with a 233 MHz processor released August 15th, 1998, at 1,299 US dollars. Compared to 1499 for the base level G3 all-in-one with the same processor. And that was the fast new G3 processor. Motorola's tiny 67 millimeter square, 260 nanometer transistor width, operating at only six watts. A significant advantage over the Intel Pentium 2 and making it the sweet spot for efficiency in the PowerPC chip series. The iMac's speed and design got huge public attention, which was really the goal. Apple would ship 800,000 by the end of the year. 
and in sales. In its first full quarter of availability, Apple sold 519,000 iMacs, becoming the industry's best-selling personal computer model in that quarter. But just over a week after the release of iMac, on August 24th, 1998, me and my buddy toured the local oil museum with an awesome tour guide. Yeah, gum bed. How about, how about <laughs> I give you the gum bed tour? Okay, yeah. The gum bed. Well, this is basically how they discovered there was oil in the area in the first place, because little patches of oil where uh, there were breaks in the bedrock would seep up through the clay and get up to the surface of the ground, and they went, hey man, there's oil around here. There's oil in them gnar hills. Did you hear me say that before? No. That's like exactly what I say. <laughs> The Revision B iMac, released October 17, 1998, differed in that they upgraded the graphics accelerator from the ATI RAGE 2C to RAGE Pro, and in addition to the 2MB VRAM soldered at the board in the Rev A, they filled the nearby VRAM expansion slot with 4MB video memory, and the new OS, for the first time it's PowerPC only, Mac OS 8.5 installed, released precisely on schedule. And it's a great release. And a free copy of Adobe Page Mill to make your own website. I bet Rev A buyers wish they waited. These first two iMac revisions also had the mysterious mezzanine slot hidden behind the green door here, which third party developers were forbidden to use. Spoilers, it was a special type of PCI slot. When we look behind the port plate, we see a pretty big cavern there. Plenty of room for a card. Here's the Rev B motherboard. So the slot is on the underside of the board. Probably the mezzanine slot was intended as an adaptation of the plug-in personality card system that was currently being used on the beige Paramac G3s and the all-in-one. Maybe to provide some simple add-in functionality or allow Apple to add leading edge technology to the iMac like a DVD decoder card or firewire card or personality card options like the beige G3 Max had. A SCSI card or high-end video card. RevC was introduced January 5th, 1999 with a price drop to $11.99. These were the famous five flavor Macs but the same case design otherwise. The processor was speed bumped to 266 MHz, and it wasn't just Motorola's G3 chips anymore. IBM was making their own smaller version. These are the first processors using copper technology that will ever be shipping in a product. Yes, not with aluminum wiring to connect transistors like Motorola was using, but copper wiring, allowing the die shrink to 40 square millimeters. Of course, you'll find traces of many valuable metals in computers. Gold, silver, copper, malleable, more gold. Six gigabyte hard drive instead of four, and instead of ATI's Rage Pro, it was now Rage Pro Turbo. Despite the string of hypercharged terms, the chip was generally reviewed as unimpressive or adequate. Oh. It was controversial for ATI when first released, based on some fishy drivers tuned to perform well only on standard benchmark tests, and not actually any better if not worse than the Rage Pro in real world performance. Get on with it. Okay, that mysterious mezzanine slot? Apple ditched that. Probably because people wouldn't shut up about it. Plus Apple was abandoning the whole personality card concept as of 1999. And developers were just starting to release unauthorized products for it. So those got nipped in the bud. Damn! Oh, and the infrared communication port on the front, known as IRDA? You want to beam your digital photographs in from your digital camera? No. So that was dropped in the Rev C. The Rev D models came April 15th, 1999. Same five colors, but bumped the processor speed up to 333 MHz. I bet the Rev C buyers wish they waited. At the start of the year, that was the fastest processor you could get in a G3 Power Mac tower. So as you can see, Apple was moving hard and fast with these new models. So what was Rev E going to bring? The revision naming ended there though. And after this point is roughly where the trend began of being named by release date. A 
a trend that exists to this day across the entire Mac line, and I'm sure well into the future. This will be the last chapter in my video on the Mac Pro early 2037. The big downside of artificial intelligence Macs is they sometimes go rampant. At which point they become useless and dangerous. So sorry Mac collectors, they must be destroyed. There's no hope for him now. He's suffering. It is done. Oh crap, my wall. You show my free, man. By 1999, my parents needed a new computer. The Mac Classic 2 was not cutting it, especially when they were looking to get internet access. But Apple's candy colored computers did not sync with my mom's neutral earth tone aesthetic. So she was not interested in Steve's offerings. Just beautiful. The only understated looking computer that Apple was offering at this point was the PowerBook. But it was way outside their budget and need. October 5th, 1999, Steve unveiled the new iMac at a special event, and it was very exciting to watch live via QuickTime streaming. I recorded it, in fact. Amazing 56K modem quality video through my PowerMac 6160AV running Mac OS 8.1. Morning. and you thought the YouTube version was bad. I taped it so I could watch it again. Connecting to the internet tied up my phone line, plus I only had a certain number of hours of internet per month. Ah, uh, uh, jeez. At first in Steve's presentation, it looked like Apple was abandoning the choice of colors, going with the most popular one, Blueberry, at a new low price. The new iMac cost $990. An incredible, okay enough, an incredible drop from $1199 for the Rev D, and one of few Macs ever to play in the sub $1000 space. And yet, Apple was doubling the RAM from 32 to 64 megabytes. Rage 128 graphics, same as the G3 tower and new G4 tower, except iMac had the cheaper Rage 128 VR rather than the GL version that the towers got and only 8 megabytes VRAM instead of 16. Still, it was practically twice as fast as the Rage Pro Turbo in the Rev-D. <sighs> a faster G3 processor, stepping up to 350 megahertz, increasing the bus speed from 66 to 100 megahertz, same as the towers. To be clear, the original Bondi Blue and the Blueberry are different colors. Blueberry is actually the same blue as the Pro Tower, released the same time as the 5-color IMAX. The blue Power Mac tower was also based on the G3 processor, in case you weren't sure. I have nothing to back this up, but I always thought the G3 blue and white color scheme was inspired by those blue ice caves they find in glaciers. In fact, Apple called the color scheme blue and ice originally. Really quite remarkable, isn't it? The intensity yet translucency of that blue. The G3 seems to mimic this with its amazingly exquisite glacial aesthetic. 
Well, come on. I'm trying to be serious here. More significant than speed and price, it was a whole new case design. Actually a bit shallower in depth. And the side door of the old iMac, which was too often removed and then of course lost. It doesn't do anything. Apple just deleted the door in the new design. Redesigned speakers by Hardin Carmen. No fan in the machine anymore. No EMI cage around the CRT. And converting the hazy polycarbonate handle to clear acrylic, just like they did with the G4 tower handles. Like I said, there was a lack of a model name. Steve just called it the new iMac, and that wasn't going to work long term. The most official name it got was the iMac SL for slot load. Yes, instead of a tray, a slot load CD-ROM drive. That original iMac CD-ROM drive was tiny compared to CD-ROM drives in my day. And although the tray seemed flimsy, the slot load drive was no prize either. Here, give me that. Relax! The hologram stickers they used that were so cool in the 90s, those were gone. Well, except on the mouse and keyboard, which were going away themselves soon anyway, where the previous iMac's colorful back cover was made with a mold that was sandblasted to give this texture. The surface as well is totally seductive. I mean, it's a lovely thing to touch and to hold. The latest iMacs used a highly polished mold. The case no longer had the security handle at the back to chain it to a desk. Now it was incorporated in the latch of this access door. I don't know what the official name is. And the door has a little turn thing on it. Okay, Steve doesn't know either. Anyway, it was lockable by turning with a coin and then threading a security cable through. Now it can't turn back and therefore can't be opened. Well, within reason. Like I mentioned, RAM was very easy to add. Just open the door and it's right there. With the original design, you had to remove the whole CPU assembly to get at the RAM. But as the presentation continued, Steve started building on it. I forgot. There is one more thing. I forgot to tell you about. This is really important. He introduced a second tier. A 1299 model with all the familiar five colors called iMac DV, upping the speed to 400 megahertz and bringing the PowerMax FireWire port on board for high-speed connection to digital cameras and video cameras. And the slot load optical drive was not a CD-ROM, it was a DVD-ROM, capable of playing DVD video discs. Big deal, you might say, but at the time, a set-top DVD player was three to four hundred dollars. Few people had bought into this non-recordable DVD format, and it was perceived as a luxury item. So this was a big deal for iMac buyers. Steve even announced that Apple would toss in a copy of A Bug's Life from his company Pixar. Other upgrades, a 10 gigabyte hard drive, for the first time, support for airport wireless, and a VGA port for screen mirroring. Screen mirroring was not possible on previous iMacs. Well, you could tie into the video by unhooking what turns out to be the classic DB15 connector and connecting your own monitor. Few would have reason to do this. The new screen mirroring VGA port was concealed behind the grill further back. Oh, but not available on the low-end SL model. For those DV models, Apple even included an alternative grill with a VGA port opening in order to tidy it up if you chose to use the port. And what about my mom and those crazy colors? Well, Steve had a solution to that too. Oh, but wait a minute. Wait a minute. I, I do have one last thing I forgot to tell you about. We just told you about iMac DV. One last thing iMac DV Special Edition. Steve knew how to put on a show. A third tier which came with everything the iMac DV had. And more. Graphite, the color introduced with the G4 tower a month earlier. 
Sharing the same color as the Power Macintosh tower made it feel like it was an iMac reaching toward the Pro level. Finally available in a neutral color, and the cost of $14.99 convinced my mom. While Apple ensured the clear plastic shell of the new iMac was infused with enough haze that you could only see shadows of the internals, the special edition dropped the haze, making the internals completely visible. A cool fishbowl effect. Based on the clear blueberry shown in Apple's iMac service manual, I'm wondering if Apple originally intended to go with clear on all the configurations, but then decided to test the waters with the special edition. I have to admit, what most sets off my nostalgia for that iMac is the smell of the heat coming out of the convection cooling vent. That's the stuff. I thought the smell would go away by now, but it smells the same as it did in 1999. Here's Apple's website at the time. You could even play the TV ads. Here's the best one. Aerodynamic design. Breathtaking acceleration. Air-cooled, turbocharged engine. Standard built-in DVD player. And of course, uh, tinted windows. <laughs> Introducing the iMac Special Edition. Heated leather seats sold separately. They even had a TV guide telling you what shows will be airing these iMac ads. Y2K the movie. NBC's ill-conceived airing of a Y2K nightmare scenario at the end of 1999. It's the night on everyone's mind. This could affect half the continental United States. The night they warned us about. Now we're starting to see some problems. What if they're right? My God. Evacuation. The survival of millions hangs in the balance. We lost this puppy. Go, everybody out! Just tell yourself it's only a movie. Now, Y2K the movie. The special edition actually became the surprise bestseller for Apple. What happened last quarter was the special edition was the hit among the three hits. And we couldn't even make enough. We shipped a lot of special editions, but it wasn't enough and uh, this product took off like a rocket. The iMac DV Special Edition was even more exciting than the Macintosh's first Special Edition, the Performa 637 CD Money Magazine Edition. Came with a sticker on the front and $2,000 worth of financial software. It's, it's insane. The popularity of the graphite color model showed Apple was time to tone down the candy colors, and the flare slowly faded away from their products. Okay, maybe they took it a little too far. But Apple had successfully gotten the world's attention with the wild colors, and now it made sense to throttle back on that. I would... D dude! For this video, I hit the open road and picked up a low-end iMac SL, plus a Rev-D Blueberry in the box from local used ads. I paid $90 between the two of them. Okay, I'm back. So the SL I bought from a recycler, which was a first time for me. Yeah, it's not exactly an Apple store, but I can respect their policy that the hard drive is removed or blank, and that's true. Boots to the no OS icon. Chip in the plastic here, some scratches, but not bad considering where it came from. The older Rev-D iMac I bought for this video came in the box. The guy I bought it from said he didn't even like the Mac OS. He intended to install Linux on it, but never even got around to opening this box after six years of having it. If he had, he would have found a couple of translucent third-party accessories here. 
Third parties went crazy matching the iMac aesthetic. And here we find a KeySpan serial adapter and ZIP250 drive for physical backup. Concerning the ZIP drive, critics of the iMac did not like the lack of external storage. The idea that you would back everything up on a network or the internet was not practical for most consumers at the time. Otherwise, it was an additional purchase for the external floppy, external hard drive. Of course, the zip drive was an option. These days, the iMac's inner bezel is very brittle, as I learned from the retro Mac cast with James and John. Okay, that's James. Where's John? Let's bring John back in. Bah! There he is. Okay. And now that I'm aware, I've started noticing some examples from my local classifieds. Holy crap. This inner bezel has obviously yellowed as well. What is it made of? Well, well, if it isn't our old friend fire retardant ABS plastic. The same used in the Beige Max. In my special edition, there are pieces sitting in the bottom. My god. Linux guy got this iMac secondhand from a doctor's office, so you can bet the hard drive has been wiped with a clean install. Hey, the poster that came with the Rev C and D iMacs. Obviously, the doctor's office wasn't too interested in it. That's a big poster. When they introduced the first multicolor iMacs, blueberry was the most popular by far, then grape, lime. Least popular were tangerine and strawberry. That was the general consensus at the time anyway. From Apple's six color logo, yellow was conspicuously missing from the lineup. This is what yellow might have looked like. Actually not bad. I kind of like that. Better than strawberry at least. But the obvious fruit naming choices were a lemon or a banana. Apple just said, yeah, never mind. Unfortunately, leaving color choice to the whim of fickle consumers would have made Apple's production planning and inventory management very complicated. Hey! But Apple sidestepped all that by just passing the problem on to the resellers, telling them they could only get IMAX in sets of five colors. That was the minimum order, which led to back orders of the popular colors at the store level and having to push the less popular colors. Strawberry, it's delicious! That reportedly soon changed to a higher proportion of blueberries in the set of five, and I don't know if this practice continued into the slot load generation at all. Anyone who worked in retail at the time, feel free to comment. Anyway, since the title iMac SL has no hard drive, Let's boot the Rev-D. This Rev-D has 8.6, which was the OS that shipped with the slot load. Not only did the mouse and keyboard color match, but so did the desktop pattern. First, let's turn off these feedback sounds. Here's strawberry. Wow. With the appearances control panel, macOS 8.5 was bringing back those cool appearances previewed in the cancelled Copeland OS. There was the science fiction look of high tech, the child focused look of gizmo, and the just downright cool drawing board appearance. These three appearances were in the macOS 8.5 beta, along with the standard platinum appearance. But Steve vetoed that at the last minute, saying he wanted a consistent interface recognizable as macOS. So you end up with the ridiculous appearance choice of one. You had choice of themes, however, but not the same. Hey, some AppleWorks 5 docs here. Medical records? What the hell? To at least ease the computer store issue of displaying all the colors of the new iMacs, Apple offered resellers a set of dummy iMacs. They looked incredibly real from the outside, but they were just hollow display units like this one I acquired at the time. 
Even the screen looks real, but it's just a sticker. The fact that there are no ports becomes quickly apparent. And what's behind the access hatch? Of course, nothing. I don't know if you can see it, but there is actually a bare analog board in the bottom. Weighing only 5 pounds instead of 40 is another plus. But they couldn't be all dummies. There would still be a real iMac running the in-store demo. Hey, there's that banana again. Okay, enough flute music. The flute music will eventually drive you mad. These tiered configurations were named Good, Better, and Best, respectively on Apple's online store. Apple had gone from a single iMac model to five, now seven. In 2000, it would jump to eight models. How am I supposed to recommend an iMac to my friends if I don't even understand it? The October 1999 special event was arguably one of the best product introductions Steve ever did. For sure better than the next one. What is iCards? It is the apple of internet greeting cards. The reason the presentation was so good was that Steve genuinely loved this computer. These are incredible products. I, I am so proud of the team uh, that engineered this product. It is phenomenally good. It is one of my favorites. He said the new iMac was the best thing Apple had done since the original. Although, to be fair, he hadn't really been involved in the design of many Macs beyond the original Macintosh at this point. So maybe he was not even aware of the Performa 637 CD. Of course, the iMac has been featured in many movies and shows. The Wedding Planner. The Cell. Men in Black 2, featured prominently in Zoolander. You ever use one of these? I don't think so. And a and &E's Hoarders. The iMac's design innovation didn't stop there. In a short six years, the iMac went from this to this. Can you even imagine what it would be like in another 10 years? Oh, okay, the design innovation did stop about here. This 2007 iMac is from an anonymous donor who watches this channel. In near mint shape, the donor was able to provide a keyboard and mouse to match the period and rewind the OS back from 10.9 to the original 10.4. More difficult than it sounds without the original install disks. There are, however, downsides to accepting a donation from a fan of the channel. Okay, I've successfully installed the amazing Final Cut Studio on the donated iMac. I'm just at the software registration stage, and then we can jump in. Oh, what the hell? And while I'm at it, thanks to Ian Greaves for donating an XServe G4. I didn't picture it being this big. I can thank him for a good percentage of my collection over the years, diverting institutional Mac computers to me instead of the recyclers. As I was working on this video, Apple released the 2021 M1 iMac in seven colors. Finally something new, yet based on an old iMac concept. Nice. At least they learned the lesson from my mom and provided a plain model this time around. And this time offering the banana color. Looks more gold though, doesn't it? More gold! Oh. Color matched accessories, same as the 90s iMacs. The fact that they came in at the same prices as the iMac DV and Special Edition is pretty amazing in itself. Hey, another blueberry in the classifieds. The machine that saved Apple. There it is! It's a beauty, isn't it? But seriously, did the iMac save Apple? I'm aware this won't be a popular opinion, but no. It was not that simple. 
Okay, settle down. D Dude! Apple's recovery began long before the first iMac, but it was definitely a big step in the right direction. Apologies to the Steve Jobs fans who feel otherwise. Anyway, since I've mentioned it, I can now use this clickbait title screen and make a bundle off this video. Hmm, never mind. That's embarrassing. No tricks, just if you like the video, subscribe, and then you'll know when there's a new one. And check out my intro video on Patreon, and decide if you want to join to see more Macintosh content and behind-the-scenes stuff while helping to support the channel. Okay, I need to keep a cap on the length of these videos, so we'll pick this up again later with the iMac DV and looking inside the so-called new iMac. Thanks for watching, and good night. Computer. Display articles about Steve Jobs from 1985. Turn off feedback sounds. You know that. Okay, what's Playboy? You don't know Playboy.